of water the constituent part of water are two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen same way soul and brahman cannot be separated as water contained in a tumbler or water contained in a vast ocean is same same way our soul and brahman god is same so very simple thing but very important the meaning of the word upanishad what does the <coughs> name of a upanishad stands for two possible traditional meanings have been ascribed to the word upanishad according to the first upanishad upanishad means sitting near or down one is the perceptor guru teacher and the other one is the pupil the disciple or shishya so when the shishya is sitting near to his guru we call a teaching is given to the pupil who is sitting nearby to his guru it refers to the way the upanishads were taught to the students in ancient india the knowledge of the upanishads was confined to a few teachers who were either akshatriyas or brahmanas they directly passed down the knowledge in person to a few select students according to their merit and under an oath of secrecy since the knowledge was taught to students who sat near the master at a lower level or at his feet while the master sat on a higher seat that is asana his teaching was called upanishad 
that means teaching imparted to a student who is sitting near to the percept since secrecy was associated with the teachings the knowledge of the upanishad is also known as the secret knowledge good knowledge at most secret knowledge that is ati ati good hai why it is secret see anything which cannot be seen or felt by our organs of knowledge so that is secret because we believe things which can be seen by our eyes or can be experienced by our sense of organs otherwise everything is secret only so the knowledge of openness is also known as secret knowledge because everything discussed in upanishad is not manifested in some form it is all in subtle form it is invisible to the eyes hence it is termed as secret knowledge according to the second interpretation upanishad means the knowledge which destroys the bonds of ignorance and leads to liberation the knowledge of the upanishad is essentially the knowledge of supreme self that is brahman and the individual self atman atman and brahman in reality is same there is no difference but only thing <coughs> when the same self is confined in a body so that is known as jiva okay knowledge of these two eternal realities is considered a true knowledge or pure knowledge in contrast to the worldly knowledge which is called asat the real knowledge of soul and brahman is sat sat means that is true and worldly knowledge that is called asat secular knowledge that is this is temporary and which leads to ignorance delusion and bondage to the cycle of birth and death since the knowledge of the upanishad destroys ignorance it is considered liberating knowledge in his commentary on the tatriya upanishad sri sankracharya suggested that upanishad means that which led to the highest bliss what he probably mean was that the knowledge of the upanishad would lead to eternal bliss by destroying bondage and suffering see the basic nature of our soul is bliss so if we when we can realize our soul we are entering into the eternal bliss treasure simple thing bliss and soul same thing there is no difference between our soul and bliss because the very nature of soul is bliss and eternal peace a third interpretation is also possible which lead to the same meaning upa which is usually used as prefix to a verb or a noun <coughs> has several meanings it means an advice or the instruction of a teacher reverence or worship and nearness or proximity in space number time or degree traditional interpretations of the upanishad take the last meaning into consideration if we go by the other meanings upanishad means an instruction or advice by a teacher in close proximity from a higher ground of awareness to students sitting below regarding the destruction shad of ignorance bondage etc knowledge and ignorance the two types see knowledge means that when we realize our soul we realize god brahman that is the knowledge and until unless we do not realize soul god so we are in ignorance so 
The two types of knowledge are mentioned in some Upanishads such as the Isha Upanishad and even in the Bhagavad Gita which is considered by some as an Upanishad in its See, our Vedanta has three basic parts. One is Upanishad, second is Brahma Sutra and the third is Bhagavad Gita. So all these three constitute the knowledge of Vedanta. They are the knowledge of the rituals, Karma Kanda and the knowledge of the liberation that is Jnana Kanda. They are also alternatively described as Vidya and Avidya, knowledge and ignorance. Vidya is the knowledge of the self that is Jnana Kanda which leads to liberation and immortality. Those who attain to attain it go to the world of Brahma by the sunlit path of important gods, Vivyana. Avidya is the knowledge of sacrifices, rites and rituals including worldly knowledge which helps individuals to appease gods and fulfill their desire. It leads to rebirth and suffering and extreme cases to punishment in the lower darker worlds. See, this is the conception of hell and Savark, heaven, hell and heaven. The Upanishads, however, do not ignore the importance of worldly knowledge and the obligations of worldly life without which the world cannot continue. By renunciation of worldly life alone, one does not have to practice spirituality to achieve liberation. One can live the life of a householder and still achieve the same goal by leading a wholesome and virtuous life. Hence, they urge people to practice balance and moderation and pursue both types of knowledge. One should pursue worldly knowledge, that is avidya, to perform obligatory duties and ensure the continuation of the world and the family lineage. Once those obligations are met, one should pursue spiritual knowledge, vidya, and strive for liberation. Now, what is the importance of Upanishads in Hinduism? The Upanishads played an important role in the evolution of ancient Indian thought. Many schools of Hindu philosophy sectarian movements and even the later day religious like Buddhism and Jainism derived richly from the knowledge contained in them. Hinduism owes its philosophical depth to the knowledge of the Upanishads only, otherwise it would have remained a religion of superficial rituals and rites and become vulnerable to superstition and obscurity. Hinduism. Indeed, they were largely responsible for its popularity and philosophical intellectual appeal. If today Hinduism is able to attract the attention of many contemporary thinkers and scholars from diverse backgrounds, not only from India but elsewhere, the credit goes mainly to the spiritual and philosophical knowledge of the Upanishads and their ageless wisdom. Regarding them, Schopenhauer commented thus the access to the Vedas by means of the openness is in my eyes the greatest privilege which this still young century may claim before all previous centuries. Upon reading the French translation of the openness from Persian by Anquetil du Peron, he said, it is the most satisfying and elevated, elevating reading with the exception of the origin text which is possible in the world. It has been the solace of my life and will be the solace of my death. The age of the openness. 
it is difficult to determine the age of the opinion. They were composed at different times and ages by different seers and scholars in the long history of Hinduism. Some, like the Brihadarnika, Chandogaya, Tatiriya, Atreya, and Kastki, Upanishads are the oldest, which some were composed during the medieval period up to 17th and 18th centuries. The oldest Upanishads, or at least portion of them, were probably composed during the early Vedic period, when the Vedas themselves were in formative stages, and the Athra Veda, the fourth in the series, was yet to be formally recognized as a Veda. Some were some were probably composed in the later Vedic period. The oldest Upanishads are also probably re renditions or fragments of the earlier Upanishads. There is little doubt that the knowledge and philosophy of the Upanishads has evolved over time through the contribution of many seers, masters and self-realized souls. As a result, they acquired greater depth and complexity for which they are known today. There is also no unanimity as to their number. There might have been 300 Upanishads or so in the past. Most of them were lost due to the secrecy associated with them and the restrictions imposed upon their teaching by the tradition. The principal Upanishads are 108, of which the major Upanishads are about 12 or 13, namely Atreya, Chandogya, Drahadarnika, Tatiriya, Kostiki, Svetswara, Kena, Katha, Matriyani, Isha, Mandukya, Mundaka, Prasna. About 30 or so are also classified as minor Upanishads since their knowledge seems to be derived from previous Upanishads. The main teachings of the Upanishads. The Upanishads occupy an important place in Hinduism as an important branch of spiritual knowledge, which is conducive to liberation. They, along with the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedanta Sutras, that is Brahma Sutra, are considered Prasthantriya, the triple means to the great journey of liberation. However, the Upanishads are not well structured or systematic. The same chapter or section may contain many ideas loosely put together without any correlation between one verse and the other. You may also find in them repetitions and redundant information. The following are the important topics and recurring the themes which are frequently found in most openings. Brahman. He is the universal supreme self, the highest god of Hinduism, who is the source of all and the destination of all. He is described as the indestructible, eternal, indestructible, mysterious supreme being who is both known and unknown, with form and without form, and transcendental and immanent, Atma. He is the individual self, an aspect of Brahman, who is pure, eternal, indescribable and indestructible in his transcendental state. In the field of nature, he becomes the embodied self, that is Jivatma, experiences duality and undergoes numerous births and deaths until his liberation. Prakriti, see, our body has three parts. One is the physical body, which is the skeleton, bones, and mm, second is subtle body, ethereal body that is called. That is your mind, your intellect, all these things, you know, prana, upa prana. So this constitutes the Subtle body, ethereal body. Third is causal body, karan sari. So that is associated with 
soul than prakriti she is the material aspect of brahman who provides materiality dynamism diversity and change to the manifested reality of brahman she is the active principle of brahman divisible but indestructible see we know matter cannot be destroyed it can be given different shapes who manages the entire creation with her innumerable powers shaktis and deluding nature that is maya creation the upanishads contain many verses which describe how the creation happened they describe brahman as the source of all creation according to them creation was an act of personal sacrifice by brahman in the beginning there was brahma only nothing else existed then he became many and manifested the world and beings devas the gods are aspects of brahman they may know him or may not know him or may know him partially they play an important role in creation and represent brahman in their highest and purest state their hierarchy in creation depends upon their knowledge of brahman and purity organs the organs in the body are partial manifestation of brahman they are also considered devas in the microcosm of beings they are vulnerable to evil influences and desire ridden actions breath in their lord they remain in the body as long as the body is alive upon death they leave the body and depart to their respective spheres see here organ means our five organs of that is the five or sense organs sacrifice the uh, om upanish such as the mandukya contained reference to the see the sacrifice is not the part of upanishads sacrifice that is you know it is misunderstood actually speaking om upanishads such as the mandukya contained references to the sacred symbol om and its correlation with brahman they describe om as brahman in the form of word aksara brahma each syllable has a symbolic significance they represent the different states and forms of brahman since it is a brahman himself by meditating upon it and chanting it one can become pure and attain a liberation then death it is one of the recurring themes in the upanishads and described as one of the first manifestations of brahman death rules our world as our is a mortal world he is the great devourer who devours everything the all means destroy everything and whose hunger is insatiable all that exists here is his food and end up becoming his food in the sacrifice of life all being become the offering to the god of death yoga references to yoga are found in several upanishads some upanishads are also known as yoga upanishads since they exclusively deal with the theory and practice of yoga frequent reference to yoga in the upanishads prove beyond doubt that the practice of yoga is rooted in the knowledge of the upanishads and integral to hindu see now the term yoga is completely misconceived it is misunderstood now doing some asanas and mudras and all is known as yoga as on today but yoga actually means uniting the soul with brahman that is actually meaning of yoga but nowadays it is all doing some asanas and all pranayam and all so that is misunderstood rebirth the upanishad explain the process of rebirth what happens when a person dies how the soul leaves the body and departs to the world of ancestors how it returns to the earth and takes another birth they also explain the circumstances will lead to rebirth 
According to the Upanishad, both men and women play an important role in the transmigration of souls and both act as carriers. I will explain this reincarnation in another video. Now, next term is Karma. The idea of Karma is mentioned in some earliest openings such as the Brahadharmika Upanishad. They explain how desire ridden action subject the body to impurities and lead to the rebirth of the souls in the mortal world, which those who indulge in most sinful actions fall down into the lower worlds and are reborn as women and insects. Bones and insects. Liberation. The ultimate goal of the openness is to help humans achieve liberation by overcoming their desires, ignorance and delusion. They explain the importance of cultivating purity through detachment and renunciation and by contemplating upon the self. According to the openness, liberation means freedom from birth and death. Mahavakyas the wisdom of the Upanishad is often condensed into short statements or phrases which are traditionally used in spiritual discussions and contemplation. They are known as Mahavakyas. The Upanishads contain important Mahavakyas such as Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahma. Prajnam Brahma, Brahma is intelligence. Tat Tavam Asi, you are that. Apart from the above, the Upanishads also contain references to the esoteric rituals, anecdotes about seers and sages, important conversations and dialogues about the self or Brahman, references to the historic events and ancient belief systems, social and religious practices, caste system, status of women and nature of consciousness and types of spiritual knowledge that is Brahmavidya, etc. Conclusion The Upanishads elevate our thoughts and expand our awareness. They not only represent the unity and oneness of the whole existence, but also remain, remind us of our unity and oneness with Brahman. Since we are divine beings who possess the spark of Brahman and represent his consciousness and beingness as his aspect. It becomes obligatory on our part to live up to the lofty vision they represent and elevate our consciousness into still greater heights. From the Upanishad we learn this. A devotee may worship God in initial stages, but eventually he must overcome his limitations and become God in word and deed so that he manifests the best and the highest in him. Through perseverance, faith and purity, he must transcend mortality and enter the realm of Brahman. This is the most important message of the Upanishad. Truly, the Upanishads are the greatest contribution of India and Hinduism to the religious and philosophical wisdom of the world. There is no exaggeration in stating that even a cursory study of the Upanishad is bound to change our thinking and ways of living. They point to the possibilities and opportunities that await us in the spiritual realm. Unfortunately, although the knowledge of the Upanishad is now freely available to all, many Hindus still tend to focus on the knowledge of the rituals rather than the knowledge of the Upanishad. It is probably how the world is meant to be. As the Bhagavad Gita suggests, out of millions of people, only few people inspire to pursue the knowledge of the self and liberation. So, here actually, Upanis, their focus is liberation. The liberation means we are free from the cycle of death and birth. That is the main aim of, that is the main meaning of liberation. Openness they focus on 
meditation part, not on the karma. As per Upanishad, karma and uh, liberation both are not much correlated. See, people they go for charity and all. So they these things, you know, they purify our mind, our wisdom. But for liberation, we have to destroy our ego. That is the most important power. Because in day to day life, we are related to people to people through our ego, through our mind. Soul of each individual is the same. The basic nature of soul is bliss and eternal peace. So our day-to-day -day uh, connection with other people is through our ego. Now ego means false I. We have two types of I. One is the true I that is our soul. The other will is the false I that is our ego. Now this ego is nothing but ignorance. When we identify ourselves with the body, so this identification of I with the body is known as ego. So we have to destroy this ego. All these subtle impressions collected in the previous births constitute our chit. Impressions are stored. So our day to day work, what we do, that is known as karma. See, karma, when we think about something, repeatedly think about something, then it constitutes our subtle impressions, what we call as sanskaras. And these thoughts, they embedded in our chit, and we call them as vasanas, propensities. These vasanas are completely controlling our life. See, sometimes we may determine not to do this thing, that thing and all, but we are compelled to, the, to do the same thing. Why? Because we are completely controlled by our vasanas, completely controlled by our sanskaras. That is the main thing. So, in Western psychology, people, they say conscious mind, subconscious mind, unconscious mind, superconscious mind. When we discuss something with other people, that time our conscious mind is working. See, so we may promise to do something, we may determine to do something that is with the help of our conscious mind, but finally we find that we are not able to do the thing what we have promised to do. Why? Because our actions are controlled by our subconscious mind. Dear friends, this subconscious mind is nothing but our soul. Remember this. This is a very, very tricky question. Our mind is nothing but the repeated thoughts arising from the soul constitute our mind. So there is nothing like that subconscious mind, superconscious mind, unconscious mind. When we are talking in awake position, when we are in we are when we are awake, 
that time we discuss we think we describe so many things that is our conscious mind that is mind but our actually source of power for the mind is our soul each and every part of our body derives power from the soul even pranas they are source of pranas in our body is soul for each and every part of the body that is driving the power and force from the soul only so that is the very basic thing so what we have in mind we must destroy our ego the conception of identification of the i with the body that is ego we have to destroy this conception then only we can realize our soul until unless we destroy the ego and mind we cannot realize our soul that is the basic purpose when the ego is destroyed mind is destroyed and we are completely vanishing our tamasic and rajasic basic natures and enter into the satvik nature so satvik nature all spiritual people advanced spiritual people their nature is satvik our complete nature you know is divided into three parts one is rajasic then tamasic rajasic and satvik people who are called holy who are called sages who are called mahatmas their nature is satvik means associated with purity and truth tamasic means people who are completely indulging this worldly affair worldly life eh? those they are tamasic in nature they are not worried about who is called what is soul and all they are they are no way need to need to the spiritual and religious aspects then rajasic means people who are you know more worried about their name and fame they are very active people so they are and those who are completely inclined towards god towards spiritual aspect of life they are called satvik so dear friends this topic was about upnis time to time i will take different topics and explain so my dear friend i have a request to make please comment like share and subscribe my channel thank you om shanti 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 hi